Hello, I'm Dr. Nicholas Tedesco, DO, Associate Program Director of Good Samaritan Regional Medical Center Orthopedic Surgery Residency, and today I'm going to give a talk about fibrosis lesions of bone and fiber soft tissue tumors as part of the ongoing online lecture series that's going to supplement our in-classroom case-based presentations. My typical disclosures, I do own stock in Romtech, an orthopedic rehab company, but it has nothing to do with this talk or any of my posted online talks. So the first thing we'll start off with is bone lesions, and then we'll head to the soft tissue masses, and we'll start with malignancies and then progress to benign entities. So the first one is fibrosarcoma or undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma of bone. These are both undifferentiated mesenchymal neoplasms with no osteoid production that arise de novo inside of a bone. On imaging, they'll show a poorly defined lytic lesion of the long bones, usually metaphyseal and often around the knee, so it does mimic osteosarcoma. It will show cortical destruction with a soft tissue mass extension on CT or MRI and usually eccentrically just like an osteosarcoma, so these can be very difficult to distinguish. However, these lack osteoid production both histologically and radiographically. So here's an example of that in the superior pubic ramus of this young gentleman. You can see this sort of permeative, lytic, destructive process involving the superior pubic ramus, a small portion of the inferior pubic ramus, and even the pubic symphysis. There may even be a pathologic fracture present, but cortical destruction for sure, which usually hints at soft tissue mass extension. You also see subtle findings of a periosteal reaction on the inferior margin of the superior pubic ramus that again suggests that this permeates through bone farther than we can appreciate on this x-ray. On advanced imaging, the CT scan will show you something very similar where you see changes within the marrow cavity, lytic destruction, cortical perforation, and you can see here there's really no osteoid production or other matrix within that lytic component. As we then switch to the MRI, up top is a T1. The central one is the fat saturated T2 and the lower one is the fat saturated T1 post contrast. So what you see is a heterogeneous lesion with predominant low signal intensity on T1 and bright on T2, but you can see there's also a lot of focal dark areas on the T2 that hint that there's a fibrous component to this. You do see soft tissue mass extension internally toward the pelvis and on the post contrast image you see a large area there of central contrast void consistent with hemorrhage and necrosis that hints that this is a a very aggressive and dangerous process. On histology, you'll see pleomorphic spindle cells in a world story form pattern. Uh, the other description for this is a helicopter landing in a wheat field. That will be for the undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma of bones. Sometimes fibrosarcoma is a little bit more organized than that with a herringbone type pattern. These will be vimentin positive, but otherwise stain largely negative on immunohistochemical staining. Treatment is going to be very similar to conventional osteosarcoma with neo adjuvant and adjuvant chemotherapy centered around a surgical resection. A greater than 90% necrosis rate is considered a good response to chemotherapy neoadjuvantly. However, there are also some studies now showing that there may not be as much benefit to chemotherapy as we had thought with these. So there may be a paradigm shift in the future where we move towards surgical resection alone. So here's an example of that histology where you see this poorly defined, poorly organized, highly pleomorphic spindle cell neoplasm on low power microscopy. You also see a lot of pink collagenous strands, especially on the right side of the image, on the upper part, and you see a lot of pink background permeating through the cellular component, which is the fibrous component. As we zoom in, now you really get an appreciation for the pleomorphism, the mitotic figures, the dense hypercellularity, but again, that pink collagenous background hinting at the fibrous nature with no obvious evidence of the lace-like osteoid production that you might otherwise see in a fibroblastic osteosarcoma. Now we're gonna compare and contrast two separate bone lesions, one of which is malignant and one of which is benign because they so closely mimic each other in clinical presentation and radiographic presentation. However, the big hallmarks in terms of differences are going to be the age of the patient and then the histology is very different. So these two entities are adamantinoma, which is a malignancy, and osteofibrous dysplasia, which is a benign entity. So adamantinoma is most commonly seen in middle-aged adults, age 20 to 50, whereas osteofibrous dysplasia is almost exclusively seen in patients under the age of 20. So if you have a child with a lesion that looks like this, it's usually going to be osteofibrous dysplasia, and if you have an adult with a lesion that looks like this, it's usually going to be adamantinoma. The treatment for adamantinoma is wide resection, 
chemotherapy and radiation therapy are generally ineffective, and a lot of that is because it is a very low-grade neoplasm. When you see osteofibrous dysplasia, treatment can be observation alone with serial x-rays as they may burn out over time or remodel. Otherwise, you may need bracing if the child is developing a plastic deformity, but otherwise, if you're going to intervene, if they do have significant deformity or severe pain, a simple curatage with or without bone grafting as needed. However, what they have in common down here, the imaging. Usually both of these are going to be in the anterior cortex of the tibial diaphysis. They will both have a soap bubble appearance with multiple eccentric cortical lucencies and septations surrounded by dense sclerosis with or without cortical expansion but generally they tend to preserve the intramedullary component. So here's an example on the left of a large adamantinoma involving the anterior cortex of the tibia, and then an example of two separate foci of osteofibrous dysplasia in a child on the right. And you can see radiographically they look almost the exact same. But one of the big differences here is you see open growth plates on the right and closed growth plates on the left. As we go to advanced imaging, these are the T2 fat saturated images. Same thing, you see preferential involvement of the anterior anterior cortex, relative sparing of the intramedullary canal, bright signal intensity on this sequence, a uh, small amount of cortical expansion and maybe even cortical disruption. So again, even on advanced imaging, these are very, very difficult to distinguish between the two. Now, when you look at the histology, here's where we see the other stark difference. So oddly enough, adamantinoma is actually an epithelial malignancy of bone. It will have the presence of keratin because of that, which differentiates it from osteofibrous dysplasia, and so therefore it'll be cytokeratin positive on immunohistochemical staining. It will show a whole bunch of separate epithelial islands with bland basaloid and spindle or squamous cell features in the background of fibrotic stroma that lacks atypia. So the malignancy is the epithelial islands. What's odd is there is no component of normal healthy bone that has epithelial-based tissue. Issue. So it's unclear where these cells come from. If there are stem cells in the bone that can somehow differentiate from a mesenchymal tissue to an epithelial tissue, or there's also some suggestion that this may be traumatic implantation where the patients may have a remote history of a penetrating injury where maybe skin gets driven into the bone from an open wound or something like that, and then years later they develop this malignancy. Osteofibrous dysplasia will show bland fibroblastic stroma with islands of woven bone with osteoblastic rimming, which differentiates it from fibrous dysplasia. So this will look very similar to fibrous dysplasia histologically, but fibrous dysplasia has no osteoblastic rimming around the osteoid, whereas this does. So here's an example of the osteofibrous dysplasia where you see all of this fibrous pink collagenous stroma in the background. You see a whole bunch of spindle cells, but relatively less cellular than the malignant version uh, of the fibrosarcoma of bone. You see this osteoid production in the center and on the right there with that denser, darker pink islands with the beginnings of lacuna and uh, entrapment of the osteocytes within it. You also see a small amount of plump cells surrounding the osteoid at certain points, it doesn't have to be all the way around it, that demonstrate eosinophilic cytoplasm, which is what gives away the osteoblasts as opposed to the fibrostroma in the background. And so you can see in that arrow on the right there that that's what we have is a few osteoblasts that are rounder cells than the remaining stroma and that demonstrate that pink eosinophilic cytoplasm. For adamantinoma histology, here you see those nests of cuboidal epithelial basophilic islands surrounded by this kind of loose fibrous stroma in the background. That's all the pink collagenous stuff surrounding all of these round blue cells. So this is the epithelial component is the round blue cells and the fibrous component is that pink spindle cell stuff permeating in between all of these separate islands. You can almost even see pseudoglandular formations at the bottom of the image there that again hints at the epithelial nature of this disease. Desmoplastic fibroma is not a malignancy, but it is a very locally aggressive benign fibroblastic tumor of bone. It, again, this is typically seen in adolescents and young adults. Imaging will show an expansile radiolucent lesion with cortical destruction 
usually epiphyseal or metaphyseal regions of long bones without any matrix production. MRI will show a destructive, homogeneous, spiculated lesion with soft tissue extension, iso-intense to skeletal muscle on T1, hyper-intense on T2, with strong but heterogeneous gadolinium uptake. So here's an example of that on the x-ray where you see this mixed lytic and elastic response in the metaphyseal region of the distal femur. It does cross the physeal scar, which is generally an aggressive sign. However, you see a lot of mature periosteal reaction mixed with a small amount of immature as a result of the expansion and likely extraosseous extent of this, but you see the dense sclerosis with septations running through this and around it that also hint that maybe this is a slower moving and more indolent process than an aggressive tumor like an osteosarcoma. On the CT scan there, it kind of confirms what we already know from the x-ray, which is the dense surrounding sclerosis, small amount of septations kind of coming into there, but cortical destruction and a little bit of soft tissue mass extension. MRI here will show that kind of iso-intense signal on the T1, the very bright on the T2 in the middle, and then this sort of mixed intralesional uptake on the post-contrast image on the far right there. One of the hallmarks though is you see the darker areas that doesn't quite look like the pitch black and coalescent hemorrhage and necrosis of a sarcoma, but instead it's more this sort of permutative, wispy, darker stuff that hints at the fibrous component of this lesion that doesn't uptake the contrast eye. On histology, you'll see well-differentiated and infiltrative spindle-shaped myofibroblasts with bland fibrous background ranging from loose myxoid tissue to abundant dense collagen fibrosis. These will look very similar to desmoid tumors, but unlike a desmoid tumor, these do not stain for estrogen receptor, cyclin D1, or beta-catenin. Treatment is wide excision for something like the one we just saw where it's completely destructive in the distal femur, and then you'll need a distal femur replacement. Otherwise, if it's contained enough or focal enough or in the right anatomic area, you can get away with a curatage with an adjuvant expander like cryotherapy, gas plasma, phenol, whatever you want to use. About 40% recurrence rate if curatage only is used. So here's an example of that where we see almost no cellular component, just a small amount of myofibroblasts hanging out in there, the dark purple stuff. But mostly it's just collagen fibers as, as thick and far as you can see. And so this is classic for a desmoplastic fibroma. Here's an example of the myxoid variant where you see looser arrangement and less collagen formation, but again, the myofibroblasts without any evidence of you know, atypia, pleomorphism, mitotic figures, things like that that might hint at a myxoid predominant malignant neoplasm, especially when you see those sorts of destructive changes. So having a well-trained pathologist is gonna be key here to getting the diagnosis. A fibrosanthoma of bone is a fibroosseous lesion. A non-ossifying fibroma, by definition, is a fibrosanthoma greater than about two to three centimeters. Less than two to three centimeters is often referred to as a fibrous cortical defect, but these are all variants of the exact same thing. These are somewhat of a misnomer when we call them a non-ossifying fibroma because they will actually ossify as the child ages. They're almost more of a dysplastic phenomenon than a neoplastic that seems to auto correct as the child moves into their 20s. On imaging, you'll see a pure radiolucent radiographic lesion with a fibrous ground glass appearance. It'll be eccentrically located, usually metaphyseal, usually will have scalloped cortices, but a nice sclerotic border indicating that the bone has walled it off and caught up to it. The classic description is the soap bubble appearance in the cortex. You usually will see cortical expansion and or thinning. And then as the child grows, it may migrate from the metaphysis more to the diaphysis as they're laying down bone at the level of the metaphysis and leaving this thing behind. MRI will be heterogeneous with a lot of dark signal on T1 and mixed with dark signal on the T2, hinting at the fibrous component. On CT scan, you usually will see focal cortical defects, very similar to a desmoplastic fibroma. So CT is generally not recommended unless you're looking for a subtle pathologic fracture because maybe the child is very painful, but the CT generally makes this look more aggressive than it actually is. So here's an example of one on the left here with that soap bubble-like appearance, the multiple septations, the sclerotic border, the hazy matrix production, the cortical thinning and a little bit of expansion, and then this is the same child 
five years later. So the one on the left, I believe, was when they were 14, and the one on the right is when they were 19. So you can see the physis is now closed. You can see it's migrated relatively more diaphyseal as the child grew, but you can see it ossifying. So it's actually getting smaller. It's sclerosing. It's looking a little bit more like mature bone. So over time, these do change and improve. Here's an example of that CT, as we talked about, where this looks remarkably similar to the desmoplastic fibroma with the septations, the dense sclerosis, surrounding it and a focal cortical defect. However, these are two very, very different entities where a desmoplastic fibroma will continue to destroy bone if left alone, whereas if these are left alone, they will eventually involute. Here's that MRI where you can see a T1 on the left, T2 in the middle, and post contrast on the right. So on the T1, you see a lot of dark signal in there with some relative preservation of bone marrow, which is the brighter signal. On the T2, you'll now see a lot of dark signal in the middle again that hints that there's probably a fibrous component to this. And then on the T1 fat saturated, contrast image on the right there, almost all the same fluid filled tissue that the T2 lights up will enhance, but the fibrous component will not. On histology, you'll see bands of collagen fibers and fibroblasts with scattered multinucleated giant cells with or without hemosiderin laden histiocytes. Treatment is going to be observation of this. Even if the child fractures through it, usually you want to just let them heal as normal and treat it like any other fracture because we know these will involute with time. However, you can consider curatage with bone graft if they have recurrent fractures or severe pain or functional pain such as that large one in the distal femur that we just saw on the MRI. That one actually fractured twice and so it was finally time to go in there and do something about it. Jaffe Campanacci syndrome is a rare syndrome that involves multiple non-nosifying fibromas. Many of these are usually more painful than the stereotypical sporadic single fibrosanthoma that we'll see in a child. And with this syndrome, they may also have cognitive delay or hypogonadism. So here's an example of that histology where you see a lot of spindle cells, a lot of giant cells, a lot of pink proteinaceous background, and it does seem to be very hypercellular, but when you really look closely, there's no pleomorphism. All the cells look very, very similar. There's not a whole lot of pycnosis to the nuclei. There's no mitotic figures, so it lacks a lot of aggressive features that you might otherwise expect when you see this degree of hypercellularity. Here's an example of that as well that shows the hemosiderin-laden macrophages, so that's what all this dark brown stuff is, is all the hemosiderin that deposited. This is sort of a rare finding on the histology, but you can see it pretty commonly. With that large giant cell in the middle, sometimes these can be confused for brown tumors in the setting of hyperparathyroidism, so you do have to be very careful and have a good pathologist once again to get this diagnosis and correlate it with both the clinical behavior as well as the radiographs. Fibrous dysplasia is a rare dysplastic entity, again, as opposed to neoplasia. However, these do have about a 1% chance of malignant transformation, usually to a fibrosarcoma of bone. Sometimes you can get osteosarcomas, undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcomas, and some other things, but that's the most common. On imaging, you'll see usually a central metadiaphyseal, so metaphyseal, diaphyseal, or right at that junction, lytic lesion, but it will have that characteristic smudged out ground glass glass appearance with endosteal scalloping, cortical expansion, and maybe even frank dysplasia of the bone with abnormal angles and rotational deformities. The classic example of this is the shepherd's crook deformity in the proximal femur. These are also commonly known to undergo cystic transformation to either have a partial UBC or ABC somewhere within it as a result of the changes in the bone. These will usually uniformly be hot on bone scan, so one of the first things you have to do when you see a patient and you've gotten the diagnosis of fibrous dysplasia is to get a bone scan to rule out polyostotic fibrous dysplasia because that usually comes with a whole host of other problems including endocrine abnormalities. On the left is an x-ray of fibrous dysplasia and on the right is a bone scan of a child that had clastic polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. So on the left we see this predominantly lytic lesion in the tibia and it's expansile but you can see there's excessive bone 
bowing of the tibia as a result, so that hints at the dysplasia. You see that smudged out kind of shower door ground glass appearance of the lesion. You don't see destructive change. You don't see an immature periosteal reaction. So this is something that's chronic, that's indolent, that's been there a while. And so this is fibrous dysplasia. When you look at that bone scan, you also get a sense of that child's femur on the right is very deformed. They've got a significant leg length discrepancy. And so that's why this is more of a dysplasia rather than a neoplasia. On histology, you'll see world fibrous tissue surrounding haphazard islands of woven bone, often referred to as Chinese letter or alphabet soup. Again, there's no osteoblastic rimming on the osteoid of fibrous dysplasia, which is what differentiates it from osteofibrous dysplasia, as we saw in the tibia of that child previously. The genetics of this, even in sporadic cases, is there's usually a mutation in the dysplastic osteoblast in the GS alpha protein on chromosome 20 that leads to a sustained activation of cyclic AMP. This has been tested multiple times in multiple ways where they ask about the protein, the osteoblast, the chromosome, or the sustained activation of cyclic AMP. So for children with polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, it's usually a somatic mutation, which is why they have it all over the place. And in sporadic monostotic fibrous dysplasia, it's usually one cell that went wrong and created this dysplastic problem in that bone. Treatment is usually observation because it doesn't really progress, it's just there. However, you you may have to go in surgically if they have severe pain, if they have an impending uh, pathologic fracture because of thinning or weakening of the bone or multiply recurrent fractures, if there's severe deformity or leg length discrepancy, if there's neurologic compromise as a result of these deformities. And what you want to do is you go in there and you curatage it out, then you want to bone graft that cavity, but you have to use cortical allograft, not cancellus. And that's because cancellus autographs are replaced by the same dysplastic bone, as is the cortical allograft, but the cortical allograft takes years to go away and be incorporated, and so it provides structural support for a lot longer time. Otherwise, you want to use PMMA, and that's because, again, that mutation is present in those cells locally, so when those osteoblasts go to create new bone, they create this garbage fibroblastic bone as opposed to true bone, and so that's why even bone grafting isn't enough here to take care of the structural defect that will be left behind. Here's that image where you have this quote unquote alphabet soup of osteoid with all of these uh, fibrous component in the background that's relatively pausicellular, very pink collagenous background. And on this low power image, it's tough to see, but as we zoom in, you're gonna see no real rimming surrounding this. So you do see lacuna and the beginnings of osteocytes within the osteoid formation there, but you don't have those round plump eosinophilic osteoblasts blast anywhere around this. So this haphazard bone is being created by these spindle cells as opposed to stereotypical healthy normal osteoblasts. So as a comparison, we're going to go back to the osteofibrous dysplasia image quickly and again look at those arrows and where the osteoblasts are and what they look like. And then we're going to come all the way back to fibrous dysplasia and again you see mostly just the spindle cell fibrous background with random osteoid production somewhere within it and no real osteoblast to be seen. McCoon Albright syndrome is a commonly tested syndrome that involves fibrous dysplasia. It is a spontaneous mutation usually, so it's not heritable. It's not that their parents had McCoon Albright syndrome. The child just happens to be born with it. This is the classic triad of polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, precocious puberty or other endocrine abnormality, and pigmented skin lesions. These are usually cafe au lait spots, and they're classically described as the coast of Maine, meaning very jagged, as opposed to the coast of California, which are smooth cafe au lait spots that are seen in neurofibromatosis type 1. They may also have yellow patches on their skin, so there's a couple of other skin lesions, and usually these lesions are going to overlie the region of the fibrous dysplasia. So some of these kids will only have fibrous dysplasia in one leg or one side of their body or something like that, and that's that's where the cafe au lait spots will be. The precocious puberty is due to overactive CNS with autonomous gonad activity. So it's irrespective of gonadotropin releasing hormone, 
luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. So you work this up with serum androgens because all of those other stimulating hormones are usually low because there's an overproduction of these autonomously. Treatment is going to be bisphosphonates to reduce the fracture rates, bone pain, and increase x-ray healing. And surgical indications are the same as for any other fibrous dysplasia. Mazabrad syndrome is fibrous dysplasia, again, usually polyostotic, not always, with soft tissue, usually intramuscular myxomas, and the, these are usually right next to each other. So the fibrous dysplasia will be in one bone, and the intramuscular myxoma will be in one of the muscle groups directly adjacent to that bone. The myxomas originate from fibroblasts that lose their ability to synthesize collagen and instead produce hyaluronic acid. These also demonstrate the same GN-alpha subunit protein mutation. Imaging, MRI will show the fibrous dysplasia, so low signal intensity on T1, intermediate to high on T2, with intense gadolinium uptake, with a soft tissue of myxoma very nearby, which will be homogeneous, low signal intensity on T1, very bright on T2, but heterogeneous gadolinium uptake. So here's an x-ray of classic fibrous dysplasia of that almost entire fibular shaft where you see the ground glass appearance again. You see cortical expansion and bowing and everything abnormal, but no real acute or immature periosteal reaction, no destructive change. But the arrows here are pointing to this abnormal soft tissue contour surrounding this. Fibrous dysplasia does not extend extra osseous, so there shouldn't be a soft tissue mass extension. So this is either a sign that maybe this has undergone change to fibrosarcoma of bone, or there's something else going on. Lo and behold, when we get that MRI, what we have is the fibrous dysplasia and expansion in the fibula, so you can see the bright fat signal on the T1 in the upper left in the intramedullary component of the tibia, but it's dark on the fibula. The fibula is also expanded to be almost the size of the tibia, and then directly adjacent to that, you see this large soft tissue mass that's it even indenting the fibula of probably from mass effect and pressure that is low signal intensity on T1, very bright on the T2, but very heterogeneous intralesional uptake on the gadolinium down below, and that's classic for a myxoma. So this is a Mazabrod syndrome patient. Now we'll move on to the soft tissue tumors. First one we'll start off with is the desmoid tumor or aggressive fibromatosis. This is an infiltrating monoclonal myofibrous tumor. It grows slow enough to invade muscle tissue as opposed to pushing muscle tissue away as is seen with sarcomas that grow rapidly. So these are infiltrative. They will have indiscrete borders on imaging. On imaging, they'll show a heterogeneous hypo to iso intense to skeletal muscle lesion on T1, hyper intense on T2 MRI. This is similar to all fibromatosis fibrous lesions with the exception of fibrous dysplasia that's actually bright on T2. The dark portions on the T2 represent the collagen, but the light represents the increased activity in the cellular component often with one active high signal region called the advancing front of the lesion, which is where it's growing from. There's strong intralesional enhancement with gadolinium and tend to have feathery and infiltrative borders as opposed to the well circumscription seen with sarcoma. In the upper left is an axial T1 showing this iso to low signal intense lesion on the left side of the paraspinal musculature extending into the subcutaneous tissues. On the right side there is the T2 that shows an overall bright signal but a lot of focal darker areas corresponding to that collagen but then down below you see the bright intralesional gadolinium enhancement without evidence of central necrosis so this is already starting to tip off a fibrous lesion as opposed to a malignancy and then when you look very closely especially on that gadolinium lesion down below the borders are feathered and infiltrative and spiculated as opposed to discrete round borders that you typically see with a soft tissue surface. Sarcoma. Here's an even better example of that. When we look at this same desmoid tumor with a sagittal sequence now, all of the borders are feathery and infiltrative. You don't really see any discrete round outline that you can create here, and this is why these are also a problem to remove because they infiltrate even beyond what we can detect on advanced imaging. So some of the fingers of this will be extending up and down that musculature that it's directly involved with for several centimeters. Histology will show a spindle-shaped fibroblast with plump nuclei and abundant collagen. It will be glossy white and very firm on gross specimen. 
It permeates between the muscle cells, so you'll often see surrounding fascicles of muscle cells randomly scattered throughout the permeative portion of this fibroblastic lesion. As we talked about before, this is beta-catenin positive, which is almost pathognomonic for this tumor. It is also C-kit, cathepsin D, and estrogen receptor beta positive. Treatment, you can see here, there are a ton of different treatments because they all stink. Leaving this tumor behind sometimes will allow it to burn out eventually that can take up to five years. So depending on where it is and how many symptoms the patient has, sometimes you can just sit on these. However, if they're very symptomatic or they're invading a critical structure, you may have to go after them. Radiation can be effective, surgical resection, cryoablation if they're small enough. Otherwise, if they're unresectable or involving major and critical structures, you can talk about low-dose chemotherapy. You can actually talk about selective estrogen receptor modifiers or even NSAIDs because NSAIDs inhibit COX-2, which is expressed by this tumor, as well as PDGF-beta that's also inhibited by NSAIDs. Interferon alpha has been used because it inhibits fibroblast proliferation. So sometimes all of these agents are used just to sort of freeze it in place until it can burn out rather than allowing it to continue to progress. So here is that pink collagenous stroma, especially like what you see in the upper right hand portion of this. The purple part is the cellular component, but relatively hypocellular, certainly not a whole lot of pyknosis or problems. And then all of the very bright, large, round balls of pink are actually cross sections of muscle cells. And so you can see this tumor permeating in between every single one of those muscle cells as opposed to just pushing them away. Here's a more close-up view of it where, again, very pausocellular. You've got a lot of pink collagenous stroma in the background. The spindle cells are very bland and benign and not a whole lot happening here. Gardner's syndrome is a tumor syndrome that involves desmoid tumors, that involves familial adenomatous polyposis, extra-abdominal and intra-abdominal desmoids, osteomas, and epidermoid cysts. There's an increased colon cancer risk at very young age and lots of other GI malignancies in these patients. It's an autosomal dominant APC gene mutation, so the big thing about these is early and often colonoscopies. Elastofibroma is a rare soft tissue fibrous mass that can mimic desmoid tumor on imaging. However, it is very classically located between the lower scapula and the chest wall, although technically they can occur anywhere, but that's almost always where these do occur. They have about a 30 to 40 percent chance of these being bilateral. So it's unknown if this is a reactive process secondary to trauma or microtrauma at the scapulothoracic joint versus some sort of genetic predisposition because there are familial cases of this as well. Imaging will show a heterogeneous, well-circumscribed, but predominantly low signal intensity on T1 and T2 hinting at the fibrous component. It won't be quite as infiltrative as a desmoid tumor and histology will show an unencapsulated mass composed of branched and unbranched elastic fibers, eosinophilic collagen bundles, and scattered fatty tissue. The elastin stain is what's diagnostic, and that's how you can tell that this is elastofibroma. Treatment is excision only if they're symptomatic because they generally don't grow that significantly or that quickly, so usually observation is all you do. So here we see an MRI of an example of bilateral versions where on the T1 signal you have this mixed low signal with fatty signal where those arrows are in the upper left. On the T2 in that same region it's all pretty much dark. Then when you look at your axial same thing. You see low signal intensity T1, low T2. It's bilateral. It's between the inferior scapular angle and the chest wall so this is classic for an elastofibroma. Here's that image. So again, you see this kind of loose collagenous pink background with very pausocellular tissue and a little bit of scattered fat throughout it. Because this looks like it almost infiltrates the fat, you can't really tell histologically that this is not a desmoid tumor just yet. But when you apply a beta-catenin stain to this, it'll be negative, whereas it'll be positive in a desmoid. And then here, when you apply the lastin stain, you see elastic fibers lighting up all over. And so this will be pathognomonic and classic for elastofibroma, whereas none of this dark elastin stain will show up on a desmoid tumor. Myxomas we briefly alluded to with Mazabrod syndrome. They're a benign, slow-growing, very hypocellular fibromyxomatous tumor that can be solitary, multiple, or affiliated with other syndromes, as we just talked about. These are homogeneous on advanced imaging with low 
signal intensity on T1, very bright on T2, but they'll be in an unusual location for a cyst or ganglion, like an intramuscular region. They may have a small fat rim around the lesion that separates it from the surrounding tissue, but not always. There may be surrounding muscle edema because sometimes these are symptomatic just from their mass effect, and they will have variable gadolinium uptake as we saw previously with that Mazabrod patient. Intralesional enhancement does occur though as opposed to peripheral enhancement, which is what rules out a ganglion cyst and rules in a myxoma. So here it is, upper left, very dark signal, intramuscular, atypical spot for a ganglion cyst homogeneous. Then on the right side there, the T2 sequence, very bright. So that does look just like a cyst. But then when you apply the gadolinium down below, you see some variable intralesional enhancement. You don't just see the dark signal like you see on a T1 with a thin rim of gadolinium enhancement at the periphery that would then tell you this is a cyst. Histology, bland spindle cells on a myxomatous background. Treatment is observation depending on the size, depending on the symptoms, depending on the age of the patient, but otherwise resection because they do tend to slowly grow over time, so they will become a problem at some point in the future if not already. So here it is. So this is the classic myxoma background, and this is important to kind of burn into your head because you see a lot of lesions that have myxomatous tissue in them. And so being able to recognize that and recognizing the subtle differences between this and the fibrous component of an elastofibroma or a desmoid tumor or a desmoplastic fibroma, things like that, help you get the diagnosis just histologically. So you can see very, very hypocellular, very, very hypocollagenous as well compared to some of these other lesions that we've seen and that's because all of that empty space is being filled with fluid which is why these have such a bright signal on the fluid sensitive MRI sequences. You can also see why they don't take up a whole ton of gadolinium because the cellular component is very very limited. Another classic example just these wispy proteinaceous fibers, a lot of empty space, bland myofibroblasts and not a whole lot going on here classic for myxoma. Nodular fasciitis is one of the most common soft tissue masses of the extremities and it's often confused for infection or sarcoma because they can grow rapidly, they can be very painful, they can be erythematous, they can look very angry and aggressive on imaging, but these are completely benign. They are very heterogeneous, but slightly hyperintense compared to skeletal muscle on T1 and hyperintense on T2 with intense gadolinium enhancement. Here it is out in the subcutaneous tissues of a shoulder where you see this heterogeneous lesion, but low signal intensity on T1, bright on T2, but post gadolinium, you see those central areas without uptake that start to make you think, uh-oh, am I dealing with a sarcoma with a small amount of necrosis centrally here? And so that's why these can be very scary when you see them. However, when you look at them microscopically, that's what gives these away. They're very pink collagenous stroma with reactive spindle myofibroblastic cells in a whirling pattern and variable hypo or hypercellular areas containing large globoid eosinophilic cells with benign nuclei with or without a lymphocytic infiltrate because they are a fasciitis. However, these were always classically thought to be a reactive phenomenon, but we've now identified a translocation 1722 with the MyH9 and USP6 fusion gene that hint that this may be a true neoplasm as opposed to just a reactive phenomenon. Treatment is usually excisional biopsy because they tend to be subcutaneous, they tend to be easily resectable, we think they're angry and ugly so we cut them out but use that as your biopsy. Otherwise, if you do biopsy it and you see that, you can just observe it because some of them will spontaneously regress. So they're a bit of an odd phenomenon. So here it is under the microscope where now you can see it. it's definitely not a sarcoma. It's very hypocellular. There's a lot of proteinaceous background, which is all the pink stuff, and especially up in the upper left there. And you see the whirling form of this where you see these nodules. So hence uh, nodular fasciitis. And we look really closely, some of the small round blue cells in here are the lymphocytic cells that are invading this area. So for the most part, a benign kind of fibrocollagenous lesion. A fibroma is a fibroblastic, possibly reactive hyperplasia as opposed to dysplasia or neoplasia, often involving a tendon sheath and thought to be the result of chronic irritation and inflammation. Imaging x-ray may show the soft tissue mass with similar density to skeletal muscle 
MRI will show a heterogeneous mass with low signal intensity on T1, high on T2, and variable gadolinium uptake, very similar to a myxoma. So here is an x-ray where you see this abnormal skin contouring, and you can see the density of whatever this is is very similar to the skeletal muscle there surrounding the distal radius and ulna. When you get your MRI on the left side of that upper left T1 image, you see this heterogeneous dark mass with focal areas of really dark signal and it's surrounding a lot of the tendons that are coming down there in the dorsal aspect of the wrist. On the T2 image on the right, you can see it's mostly bright, but again, you have those darker regions indicative of a fibrous lesion. Post gadolinium down below, you don't see a whole lot of gadolinium uptake compared to the surrounding tissue. And again, this is sort of common for some of these fibrous lesions. Histology will be a bland spindle cell shaped myofibroblast mix with dense fibrous matrix and frequent slit-like vessels. That's the giveaway for these. Vimentin and strongly smooth muscle act in positive because of the myofibroblast component. They may actually have a translocation as well to 11. That's not seen in all of these though, so we're not sure what role that plays in this disease process. Treatment is usually excision because they tend to grow over time and they usually are symptomatic. Up to a 40% recurrence rate though, because they have an infiltrative growth pattern and because they're so benign, we usually don't want to do a wide surgical resection that may damage some significant tissue. So here you see almost all collagen and very few cells, very densely packed collagen. It's not loose like you see with a myxoma. And then you see these slit-like vessels where these arrows are pointing to that, where you have the small amount of cuboidal endothelium surrounding them, but they're not round. They're, they're these oblong slit-like vessels, and this gives away a fibroma. Finally, we have a collagenoma. These are often seen multiply in multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome types one and three, chronic myeloid leukemia, syphilis, Hunter syndrome, bushke ollendorf syndrome, Proteus syndrome, and the chagrin patches of tuberous sclerosis are collagenomas. These are most often cutaneous or subcutaneous. Histology will show abundant storiform bundles of collagen or elastin deposition separated by mucinous clefts with scattered fibroblasts. They're CD34, Vimentin, and Factor 8A positive with melanin markers negative because again, when they're in the skin, sometimes we can get worried we're dealing with an amelanotic melanoma. Treatment is observation versus surgical resection. You must work up an underlying disorder as we saw above when multiple of these are present. So here's an example where you see these cutaneous nodules. They tend to be in a big patch like this and not a discrete mass. And you can even see on the lower left part of this picture is another one of these. So this is someone that's going to need workup for a full syndrome. So here it is, the story form collagen deposition with those mucinous clefts in between the collagen. So very classic, and you can see the skin surface right there to the right, so these are immediately subcutaneous and just a ton of collagen without a whole lot of cells, and hence the term collagenoma. Another example of it, where it's just closer up, where you can finally see the actual fibroblasts that are creating this, but again, the storiform collagen with mucinous clefts in between, not a whole lot going on. So I'll leave you with my Pacific Pride slide. This is a view looking east to the Cascades from Mount Baldy, which is just south of Eugene, with a bunch of fog down in the valley right at sunrise. Thanks for your attention.